Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Today is Easter Sunday. Today we celebrate the victory of Jesus Christ over the grave and over sin. And today is is an important day on the Christian calendar. This is really the hinge in so many respects of the gospel. This is the center point of the gospel. Uh, This morning, many of us would have tuned in to worship services where we focused on the narrative of of the Easter event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, This afternoon, we're going to spend some time looking at something slightly different. We're going to be looking together at the doctrine of baptism. Now, maybe on Easter Sunday, that seems like a bit of a strange focus to have as as we open God's Word. But actually, there's a very tight connection between the doctrine of baptism, the the sacrament of baptism, and the events of Easter itself. If you know church history, uh, especially the early church uh, history that we have, you'll know that the early church Uh, celebrated Easter together with baptism so often. Uh, As was often the case, uh, new believers would be coming to the faith, and after a period of catechism, after a period of instruction, they would uh, be uh, interviewed, and they would profess their faith, and then they would be ready for baptism. And the church often had these events, these baptismal services, on Easter Sunday. It was a, a beautiful moment in which new believers were incorporated into the church, and they were united to Jesus. Jesus Christ by faith, and they shared in his death, and they shared in his resurrection. So Easter Sunday was a very appropriate day uh, to see baptisms happen. Of course, as church history moves on, we see a shift happening in the church. Uh, certainly when you look at the book of Acts, I think what you're seeing is, is the gospel heading into new frontier. It's pushing into paganism, and so the, the people that you're, you're meeting on the pages in the book of Acts are new Christians. They are converts. But as we move into the second generation and into the third generation of the church, we begin to see more infant baptism taking place. We start to see grandparents and parents and children on the membership roles of the church. And so what happens is, as church history progresses forward, we see this tight connection between Easter and the annual baptism services beginning to diminish because, of course, people would have children and they weren't all that excited about waiting an entire year, potentially, for their child to be baptized. They wanted their children to be baptized as soon as possible. But with all of that in mind, I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Paul's New Testament letter to the church in Rome. I'd like to read with you Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. It's the entire chapter, and it's very clear as we read this chapter that the ancient church took its cue from a passage like Romans chapter 6. So let's look at that together. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. 
But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Well, today we're continuing our discussion on the means of grace, the ordinary means of, of grace that the Holy Spirit uses to create and to confirm or to strengthen faith. Now, if you remember last time, uh, we looked together at the Heidelberg Catechism and what it says in Lord's Day 25 about these things. Uh, Lord's Day 25 asked the question, well, if faith uh, makes us share in Jesus Christ, if we're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ, well, where does this faith come from? What's its source? And the answer there was, by the Holy Spirit who works it in our hearts through the word, through the preaching, and through the sacraments. It's strengthened through the use of the sacraments. And then we learned in, in Lord's Day 25 that in the New Covenant era, ushered in by Christ's death and resurrection, there are two sacraments, and both of these are instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the sacrament of baptism, and there's the sacrament of Lord's Supper. And these, together with the word, are the ordinary means of grace. Now, at the outset of any sort of conversation about these things, we should be clear about a couple of things. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit creates faith through the word, ordinarily. And the sacraments are what the Holy Spirit uses to strengthen existing faith. The, the sacraments do not create faith. They support the word and their means of grace that believers use as they walk through this life on the way to new, the new Jerusalem. They, they use these to strengthen their faith by God's grace. And so that's, a, that's a, an important um, hierarchy, maybe that's not the right word, but this is an important arrangement that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds as we talk about these things. Now we're talking about the sacraments. What are the sacraments? Well, again, we can look back to Lord's Day 25. And to be perfectly honest with you, if we look at Lord's Day 25, uh, there's a bit of a spoiler alert in question and answer 66. In fact, if, if you read question and answer 66 already, um, and if you're familiar with it, then that's pretty much a dead giveaway of everything that's going to be said in Lord's Days 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. Uh, I remember when I was learning how to write essays in university and in high school, the, the method that we were told to use all the time was tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then remind them of what you said. And so you can see that happening in the catechism here already in, in question and answer 66. They tell us what they're going to say, and then they're going to say it again to us today. So let's look at that again just as a, as a way of review. Uh, question 66 asks this question, what are the sacraments? And the answer there is the sacraments are holy, they are visible signs and seals, they were instituted by God so that by their use he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And this is the promise, that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Now we could rephrase uh, this question. We could say, well, what do the sacraments picture? Um, what do they point to? What is this promise that they point to? And it's very clear that the sacraments, both of them, point 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They point to an unchanging reality. Christ, he said from the cross, it is finished. Christ paid our debt in full. So both baptism and the Lord's Supper, they point to the same reality. They point to an unchanging objective truth. Now this is important that we understand this. This is very important that we understand this at the outset of any sort of discussion on the sacraments. This is theological language when we speak to uh, the, the sacraments pointing to an objective truth. And I want to press this a, a little bit for you uh, this, this day because it, it will help us understand uh, certainly th- questions like for whom uh, is, is baptism to be administered. Uh, by way of comparison, we could look to other passages in the scriptures. Um, so in the New Covenant era, we have the, the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper. But if we turn backwards in our Bibles, we find different covenants throughout the Bible. We could go all the way back to the first chapters of the Bible. Uh, we find God's covenant with creation, God's covenant with Adam in particular, in Genesis 2 and 3. He tells Adam to be fruitful and multiply, but but he gives them all sorts of things. And you could say there's there's two ordinances, there are two signs and seals uh, in this covenant. One is the tree of life, and one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, neither of these trees point to a subjective reality. Neither of these trees point to Adam's faith and Adam's obedience. Both of these trees, they point to God's sovereignty. They point to God's goodness and grace. They point to God's trustworthiness. They point to an objective reality that never changes. Now, if we flip forward in our Bibles to Genesis 8 and Genesis 9, we find the story of the flood. And after the flood, uh, the ark settles on top of a mountain and and Noah and his family, they go out of the the ark and Noah sacrifices some, some offerings to the Lord. And the Lord smells these offerings. And he says in Genesis 8, verse 21 and 22, that, that he's never going to, to destroy the world ever again. He actually says in, in Genesis 8, verse 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And then as a sign, as a symbol of this promise of the Lord, God put a rainbow in the sky. Now again, we we need to understand here, this sign was not symbolizing uh, Noah's subjective response. We know that God knew already there that mankind would continue to be sinful. Uh, Just like mankind was sinful before the flood, he would be sinful after the flood. And yet God says, I'm not going to destroy this earth any any longer or, or again. And so he puts this rainbow in the sky. It's a picture of his objective promises. Then we can fast forward again to Abraham, where God enters into a relationship. He makes a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 11 and following, the Lord, he promises to Abraham that he's going to be his God. And he's going to be a God to all of Abraham's descendants. And he's going to give Abraham the land in which he is sojourning. He's going to give this land to Abraham's descendants forever and ever. And he's going to be their God. And then as a sign of that covenant, the Lord gave the sacrament of circumcision. And again, the the sacrament of circumcision was not so much a picture of Abraham's faithfulness. He responds and he does this to his whole household. But the sacrament of circumcision pointed to an objective reality, God's promises in this covenant. Well, finally, we can think of the Passover feast that the people of Israel celebrated for nearly 1,500 years after the very first Passover that took place in Egypt. For 1,500 years, uh, the people of Israel, every year, they would gather together, they would slaughter a lamb, and they would remember how the Lord had delivered them from Egypt and how on that night they had been asked to take the blood of this lamb and, and to paint the door frames of their homes. They remembered how God had been faithful. They remembered what God had done. 
Now, this past week, someone uh, shared a clip with me uh, of D.A. Carson speaking about the Passover event, the very first Passover event. And he imagined a situation uh, in which there were two Israelites. And they were speaking about the instructions of Moses and how they were supposed to take this blood of the lamb and they were supposed to paint it on the, the, the door frames of their homes. One of the individuals wasn't entirely confident. He, he did it, but he wasn't sure that it was going to work. The other individual, he also did it. And as they were speaking together, he was utterly convinced that his family would be spared because of this blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And so Carson asked the question, uh, the next morning after the angel had passed through Egypt, whose family had been spared? And his answer was both of them. Both families had been spared. It was not the subjective quality of the one Israelite's faith over the other Israelite's faith that had spared them. It was the blood of the lamb, the objective reality of the blood of the lamb. Now we come full circle and we come back to the new covenant era. We come back to the sacraments of baptism and the sacraments of Lord's Supper. What do they point to? Do they point to an objective reality, to unchanging promises, gospel promises, or do they point to our subjective response to those promises? I hope you see where I'm I'm going with these these questions. Uh, Take another look again at answer 66 in the Heidelberg Catechism. What did it say there? It said the sacraments are holy. Uh, That means they're they're special. They're set apart. They're visible signs and seals. They were instituted by God. So we don't make them up ourselves. God instituted them so that by their use, he might the more fully declare and seal to us. It's him telling us what? the promise of the gospel. And what's the promise? This is the promise, that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Now, why am I belaboring this point? Well, among Protestants, there has been some disagreement about the use of the sacraments. Now, interestingly, I think what you would find is, generally speaking, Protestants at least, are in agreement when it comes to the sacrament of Lord's Supper. We, we all agree that the sacrament of Lord's Supper, the, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, they point to an objective reality. They, think they, they point to our forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. Just think of the words of the institution. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is the cup of blessing poured out for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. It, it seems fairly straightforward. But then we come to the sacrament of baptism. And our, our Baptist brothers and sisters, they, they seem to shift the emphasis. The emphasis seems to shift away from the objective promises of God And that's what's symbolized and signified in in the sacrament. And and the emphasis seems to shift to our subjective response to the objective promises of God. Now, you can see how this leads into their position on baptism. How could an infant be baptized if an infant is unable to profess a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? But if baptism, like the Lord's Supper, and like all these other signs of of the covenants of old, if it points also to an objective reality, wouldn't that mean that even infants could also be included and receive this sign and seal? Just think back to these, these ancient covenants that I talked about a moment ago. God made a covenant with Adam and his descendants. God made a covenant with creation, but he he made a covenant with Noah and his descendants. God made a covenant with Abraham and all his descendants. And actually, if we fast forward to the book of Acts and we find the apostle Peter delivering his Pentecost speech to the people of Jerusalem, predominantly a Jewish audience, even though people had come from all around the world, they were were ethnically Jewish. Uh, 
Peter, he, he speaks to them, he preaches the gospel, and we read in Acts chapter 2 that they are cut to the heart, and they ask the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And then Peter responds in Acts 2 verses 37 through 39 with very covenantal sounding language. He says, repent and be baptized, all of you, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for all who are far off. It's, it's for your children, he says. Now, when he says this in Acts chapter 2, there wouldn't have been red flags going up in his uh, Jewish audience's ears. They, they would have understood this. Of course, the promises are for the children. The promises have always been for believers and their children. I love how uh, the theologian B.B. Warfield, he's, he passed away in 1921. He was a theologian in Princeton Seminary before Princeton Seminary went off the rails. Uh, but anyway, he, he framed up this whole discussion in a beautiful way, in a polemic um, for infant baptism, uh, against just believer-only baptism. And this is what he writes uh, in that document. He says, No man can read the heart. And as a consequence, it follows that no one, however rich his manifestation of Christian graces, is baptized on the basis of infallible knowledge of his relation to Christ. So he's saying here uh, that nobody can read the heart, and so even if we baptize a new believer, a convert, we don't actually know their heart. Only God knows their heart. So inevitably, he continues, he says, all baptism is administered on the basis not of knowledge, but of presumption. Now, we can say we, we look at an individual and we see that there's fruit in their life and there's been a, a credible profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but, but they could be lying to us. There is a degree of presumption. That's okay. That's the way it is. But he continues, And if we must baptize on presumption, the whole principle is yielded. And it would seem that we must baptize all whom we may fairly presume to be members of Christ's body. In this state of the case, it is surely impractical to assert that there can be but one ground on which a fair presumption of inclusion in Christ's body can be erected, namely, profession, personal profession of faith. Assuredly, a human profession is no more solid basis to build upon than a divine promise. So soon, therefore, as it is a fairly apprehended that we baptize on presumption, and not on knowledge, it is inevitable that we shall baptize all those for whom we may on any grounds fairly cherish a good presumption that they belong to God's people. And this surely includes the infant children of believers concerning the favor of God to whom there exist many precious promises on which pious parents, Baptists as fully as others, rest in devout faith. Baptism signifies the promises of the gospel. In his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, Kevin DeYoung writes about the fact that he was baptized as a child. And he says, I was baptized as a little baby decades ago, but the promise of God's grace is no less real to me. And then he acknowledges, yeah, my sins were not magically wiped away by the water, but the promises of God's cleansing signed to me that day is mine through faith. So when we baptize a child, God makes promises to that child. Think of our form for baptism. God the Father makes promises that he'll adopt this child. God the Son makes promises that this child is, is uh, washed in the blood of Christ. God the Holy Spirit promises that he will sanctify them and that he will work faith in their hearts. We could say the exact same thing happens when someone makes a credible profession of faith for the first time and they're baptized into the church as new believers. There's, there's only one sacrament of baptism. There's not a, a, a first sacrament of, of believer baptism and a, and a second sacrament of infant baptism. They both point to the same reality. God makes these promises to us. Now, there are different ways of describing this, of course. Uh, as we read through the, the first few verses of, of the letter to the Romans in, in chapter 6, we see how the Apostle Paul emphasizes this uh, in that we are 
baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, as in our old nature, our sinful nature, is, is put to death with Jesus. We are united in that death. And we are raised to new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, something that is, is beautifully pictured, of course, in baptism by immersion. We don't see very many of those, but there's this sense of when someone goes under the water, they've been buried. They're, they're dead. You can't breathe underwater. And then they're brought back up to life uh, when they are raised up out of the water. Now, that's not the only way uh, to describe baptism and, and what baptism points to. And the Heidelberg Catechism speaks about a different aspect of baptism. It speaks about baptism as a picture of washing, as a picture of cleansing. And look at what question and answer 69 asks. It, it says there, well, how does holy baptism signify and seal to you that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross benefits you? And the answer is, well, in this way. Christ instituted this outward washing, and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul. And then we get the follow-up question and answer in, in question 70. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? Now maybe the mentioning of, of the spirit seems strange all of a sudden. Okay, we, we get it that um, we're baptized and baptism pictures uh, for us in, in a very visible, tangible way that the water washes dirt from our body just like Christ's blood washes sins from our body. But what's this business about the Spirit? Well, again, I, I mentioned it earlier where we read in the form how the Father makes promises, the Son makes promises, and the Spirit makes promises in our baptism. And that comes straight from Christ's words. Uh, Christ instituted baptism in Matthew chapter 28 at the Great Commission. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, into the name of the Son, into the name of the Spirit teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So that's where these things come from. Uh, so let's take a look again at answer uh, 70. What does it say there? It says in answer 70, it says there in, in answer 70, to be washed with Christ's blood means to receive forgiveness of sins from God through grace because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. That's pretty easy to hear echoes of Romans 6 in answer 70, isn't it? Uh, that we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. We are buried with Christ and we are raised to new life. But it's all very awesome, isn't it? That's what our baptism pictures, that we are dead to sin and alive to Christ. We are washed from our sins. Just as water washes dirt from the body, so Christ's blood washes our sins and our impurities away. There is such a tight connection between the sacrament of baptism and the thing that it signifies, the gospel. In fact, it is such a tight connection that there have been people throughout church history that have misunderstood this connection and sort of blended the two together. And this comes from passages like Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And what does it say there? It says, the Apostle Paul is writing, he says, He saved us, God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And then listen to this by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, you can hear this connection. And a verse like this is precisely why the Roman Catholic Church to this day still believes that water baptism has regenerating power, that water baptism itself washes away original sin. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is writing in Titus 2. Again, he's using sacramental language, and there is a tight connection between the two. 
but we just need to read the rest of the scriptures and we see again and again and again it is only the blood of jesus christ it's not water it's not holy water it's no sacrament only the blood of jesus christ washes our sins away he is the only way he is the way the truth and the life his sacrifice on the cross it is the only way of our salvation and baptism simply in a powerful and beautiful way points to that whether we see an infant being baptized or whether we see a new believer being baptized now here's a question for all of us today as we're thinking about these things maybe this seems like a a fairly dry and abstract doctrine to you to be mulling over on on easter sunday where's the application here well i think it's good that we reflect more frequently on our baptism I think it's good that we reflect on these things more frequently when we witness the baptisms of other people. You know, we can become so discouraged in life. We can become so worn down and beaten down by just the trials in this life and the anxieties in this life. Now, we, all of us, we're, we're going through a bit of a difficult time now as a congregation, but as, as individuals as well. Some of us have been laid off of work. Some of us are business owners, and we've had to lay a number of people off. Some of us, we we cannot even work right now because it's not even deemed essential services. And then others of us, there are parents, there are moms who are at home. They've been at home for weeks on end now, uh, cooped up at home with their children. Kids can't go out. Uh, You've been asked to do schoolwork, and it's being piled on, and there's stress, and there's anxiety, and all of these things. And in all of these situations, we find ourselves failing. We find ourselves failing time and again. We lose our temper. We lose our patience. We get irritable. We get angry. We say things we shouldn't say. We we think things we shouldn't think. We don't trust God enough. We feel like miserable failures and we break down. We've all been there. We've all been feeling it. So it's good for us to think about our baptism. Even on our worst days, we're reminded we have been baptized. We are we are nobility. You are a daughter of the king. You are a son of the king. When you were baptized, God the Father promised he would adopt you to be his child. When you were baptized, the Lord Jesus Christ promised that just like that water that that spilled on your forehead or if you were immersed, that water washes dirt away from your body, well, your sins have been washed away. Even your failures every day this past week. When you fail again, you you think of your baptism again, and you think that the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave on Easter Sunday, that same spirit, he's alive in your heart. And he gives you the power to walk in newness of life. He gives you the power uh, to overcome sin in your life. Just like we read in Romans 6, you are not under the dominion of the law. You are under the dominion of grace. You are not a slave to sin and lawlessness. You are slaves to righteousness because you have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. So on this Easter Sunday, may that be your hope as you think about Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the empty tomb and his victory over the grave, his victory over sin, and you think about how you are united to Christ by faith and how you hear that as we open the word and how you remember that every time we think of our baptism, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be blessed by you. And we pray that your spirit will continue to work in our hearts. We pray that your spirit will continue to strengthen our faith as we open your word. But Lord, we also pray that as we remember our baptisms, as we look forward to worship services where we will see baptisms and we will participate in the Lord's Supper, Father, as we think about these things, we pray that you will strengthen our faith, that you will remind us time and again of the gospel promises that we are forgiven in Jesus Christ, that every day there's a new opportunity to walk in newness of life. Sin doesn't have the last say in our, in our lives and in our existence. Christ's blood paid in full. And so, Father, may that be our hope and our joy as we go forward in this week. Amen.